Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Julia DeMarinas, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Here we go. Um, and so this is a little bit of a different presentation than the, the last. I, I will be happy to be your rogue presenter today. Um, so I am a, a graduate student at UC Berkeley, and I'm in the Berkeley SETI Research Center, the Breakthrough Listen Labs. And um, I've been in the field of astrobiology for long enough that I've collected some uh, affiliations, which you can see here, that if there's time, I can talk a little bit about them. But um, um, I just wanted to get kind of into the slides at this point. Um, so for my presentation, we're going to talk all about size and scale. Um, we're talking about billions and trillions of things with your RFIDs and um, products that you're tracking. So I thought um, this presentation is trying to put this all in context in in astronomical terms. What is what does scale look like to an astrobiologist? So really quick, what is astrobiology? Um, and if anyone has a take wants to take a gander, um, go ahead, type it into the chat. I would like this to be a little bit interactive. Um, I'll give you a few seconds um, to type in what you think astrobiology is. Have you heard that term before? Is it completely new? <laughs> life in space. Um, search for alien life. Exactly. And NASA defines it as the, whoa, a lot of chats here. Cool. <laughs> You're all on the, on the right path. Um, NASA defines it as the origins, evolution, distribution, and future of life on Earth and in the universe. Um, so that's just kind of the generic uh, term for astrobiology. But yes, it's searching for life in the universe. And I love this subject. It's my life passion. And I'm really excited to be here today talking to you about it. So let's think about outer space. Uh, it turns out, I don't know if you all know this, but space is really, 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 really big. Um, and I want you to, to take a guess in the, um, in the chat. What do you think these things are that are flying at the screen? Oh, I forgot to start my timer. I'm going to do that now. Galaxies. Yeah, excellent. So yes, these are in fact galaxies. Um, my question for you now is how many stars do you think, or let's start with here. How many galaxies do you think there are in the universe? And no Googling, just off the top of your head. Trillions and trillions and billions, three billion. Unknown amount, but a lot. Billions and billions. Um, yes, there's about uh, two trillion galaxies from our current estimates. This could change. Uh, this was only updated in 2016. Before that, we thought there were about 400 billion. So now we know that there's about 10 times as much as that. Trillions of galaxies in the observable universe from as far as we can tell with our technology. All right, next question. How many um, stars do you think are in an average galaxy? Four. Thanks, Chris. Um, millions, hundreds, or thousands, trillions, one million. Great guesses here. 300 million. Yeah, about 300 million. <laughs> 42. I love it. So give or take 300, um, excuse me, 300 billion. 300 billion is about the amount of stars in an average galaxy. Our galaxy has about 400 billion stars in it. All right. Now, how many how many planets do you think are orbiting the average star? David says five, four less than one. Um, according to Dr. Courtney Dressing, um, who's a professor at UC Berkeley, uh, her PhD research estimated to be about 2.5 stars, or excuse me, 2.5 planets per star. So that's a lot of uh, math. Um, that's a lot of numbers. Um, so how do you how do you even start thinking about the grandness of the cosmos? So we're, we have a few little uh, demonstrations here. Um, we're gonna make a model. We're gonna take it back to like elementary school days. 
because I think this is a really fun place to start thinking about size and scale of the universe. We're gonna take it close to home. We're gonna make a model of the Earth and the moon, right? We can do this. Um, so we have four marbles here. We can pretend they're ball bearings since that was the, uh, I know that was one of the speaker's um, products. So we've got this one kind of shooter marble, two, a little bit smaller, three, a little bit smaller, and then four teeny tiny. You can see them on the screen here. Um, if we're scaling down the moon and the earth to about the size of marbles, what size, uh, which two would they be? So you can pick one, you can type in the chat, your moon uh, should be blank and your earth should be blank. There's only one correct combination here and don't Google it. Let's see what, oh, we got a lot of different combinations. We've got a one and a four, one and a three, two and a three, one and a four, Two and a four, one and four, great. I love the different answers here. And I give this, I give, I do this demonstration to children and adults, um, PhD students, PhD uh, doctors, and most people get it wrong. Okay. So the correct answer, drum roll please, is two and four. And if you want a cool uh, fact for your back pocket, uh, say you want to impress, impress a date or something. Um, uh, we know that four um, moon diameters fit across the Earth. So here we go. Here's that uh, two and four combination. You can fit four moon diameters across the diameter of the Earth. And if you are like, hey, what about the other combination? I just did that quickly for you. Uh, this is um, one and three, which would be just a little over two. Whoops. All right, really quickly. Yeah, okay. Um, would make a cool eclipse. It would for sure make a cool eclipse. Um, all right, so one more quick demo. How far apart are the Earth and the Moon? Um, according to this scale, we've got our two and our four. A lot of people don't realize how tiny the Moon is compared to uh, Earth. If they were this size, um, about the size of your standard shooter, how far apart you can use in inches, centimeters, meters, school buses, spatulas, grains of sand, whatever your favorite um, unit of measurement is, how far apart would these be? <laughs> Someone's measuring in time, I like that. Uh, many, many miles, 15 centimeters. Um, so, <laughs> okay, so in this scale, they'll be about a meter apart. So I think this is about, if you can see where I am. Um, uh, so not a lot of people realize how far away the moon is from the earth. It takes about uh, three, it took about three plus days for the astronauts, the Apollo astronauts. Oh my gosh, here we go. Sorry, I have this like very sensitive mouth, mouse. It took the Apollo astronauts three days to reach the moon in a powerful rocket. Um, so it's pretty far away. It's pretty small. Not a lot of people uh, realize that. Um, I see a question about detecting moons of exoplanets yet. Um, that's a good question. I, if there's time, I'll, I'll get back to that. But there, another uh, fun uh, point is that there are 30 Earth diameters can fit in between the Earth and the moon. All right, um, I might skip this video uh, just because we're running short on time and I wanna uh, have some time for questions. I, and Chris, correct me if I'm wrong or Carolyn, um, Maybe that's a good idea. Okay, let's skip this. Yeah, I'll drop the video. It's like a power of 10 video. Um, okay, so we just learned about the size and scale of things. Um, that last video just showed like how far apart things were to scale. Um, I can drop the link in the chat later, it's great. Um, but basically the punchline is the stars are really, really far away. Um, if to scale uh, Earth and, and the moon, the, like the sun would be um, about half a mile, probably more away from our, our marble Earth in this scenario. So very far away, as you probably all know. Um, so we've, we are looking for these exoplanets around these stars. And we have a few, and, we're, and in my field, uh, we're astrobiology, we're looking for exoplanets, signs of life, signs of technology. And there's a lot of data that involve, is involved um, involved in this. So I just wanted to show you a few slides with some numbers. So Kepler, 
I had to write these down because I had to look up how many <laughs> stars. Kepler studied 156,000 stars in that part of the sky. Uh, and if you're an astronomer, it's in, in the summer triangle. Um, and then we have now uh, the TESS Transiting Exoplanet Survey is studying 200,000 stars. Um, and so far, Kepler has found uh, a thousand exoplanet candidates, or a uh, found a, a thousand candidates and TESS so far has discovered 1,835 candidates. Um, for the search for techno signatures, uh, we do some crowdsourcing um, and there's crowdsourcing and citizen science involved in all of these uh, searches for um, exoplanets and signs of life out there um, that I just wanted to, to bring up. There's a great program called um, uh, Zooniverse, and the you can actually work with public data for the Kepler and the TESS mission and look for um, dips in the light curve, and you could find yourself an exoplanet. Um, for SETI at Home, uh, this service is, uh, we've recently stopped doing, um, uh, using your uh, computer as like a server to analyze data, but we had to uh, do that to, to even process all of the data that we were getting in. Um, so most of these uh, searches for life out there, the searches for exoplanets, um, use supercomputers, and some of them use uh, citizen science. So that's how um, astrobiologists work with big numbers to try and find um, life out there in exoplanets. So just for uh, perspective, the Kepler telescope had about 300,000 volunteers carefully looking through um, exoplanet uh, light curve data. But I think I'm a little bit out of time, so I don't want to belabor this anymore. I just wanted to show you how um, astrobiologists deal with big numbers, um, billions and billions and trillions. So just for some visuals, uh, fun facts to remember. And if you're interested in science communication or interested in any of um, this kind of work, I do a lot of outreach and I am currently in a PhD program. Uh, this is my contact information and would love to chat with you further. Um, and thank you for your time. Fascinating stuff. Thanks so much, Julia. In the interest of time, we'll ask you to um, please, there's a lot of questions for you in the chat box if you don't mind answering those while we bring up our next speaker, Sean with Alfred Williams and Company. So thanks again, Julie. We appreciate you being here with us today. You're welcome.